That was pretty cool. Oh my god, that's awesome. Oh. Whoa, what? What in the hell is big data? Data. Data. So, what exactly is big data? It's clear that it's become a huge buzzword in tech with rapidly evolving definitions. Most simply, however, it refers to the large-scale analysis of huge, even monstrous amounts of data. There are a ton of articles written about how we're approaching the zettabyte in terms of total data usage, which is approximately 1 trillion gigabytes. That being said, big data has huge implications in the field of computational medicine, where artificial intelligence, billionaires, and cognitive computing have come together in a massive battle against the world's most life-threatening diseases. So we've seen several interesting applications in healthcare. The folks who work with big data, for them, they talk about that their biggest problem is we have so much information. And the biggest problem is how do we organize all that information? For us, even though the light is better on the internet, the data that would help us solve the problems we're trying to solve is not actually present on the internet. And what they're talking about is all of the information that we're generating through our interaction with and over the internet. Everything from Facebook and Twitter to music downloads, movie streaming, all this kind of stuff, live streaming of TED. So we don't know, for example, how many people right now are being affected by disasters or by conflict situations. We don't know for really basically any of the clinics in the developing world which ones have medicines and which ones don't. We have no idea of what the supply chain is for those clinics. We don't know, and this is really amazing to me, we, we don't know how many children were born or, or how many children there are in Bolivia or Botswana or Bhutan. And part of the reason why we don't know anything at all is that the information technology systems that we use in global health to find the data to solve these problems is what you see here. And this is about a 5,000-year-old technology. Some of you may have used it before. It's kind of on its way out now, but we still use it for 99% of our stuff. Um, this is a paper form. And what you're looking at is a paper form in the hand of a Ministry of Health nurse in Indonesia who is tramping out across the countryside in Indonesia on, I'm sure, a very hot and humid day. And she is going to be knocking on thousands of doors over a period of weeks or months, knocking on the doors and saying, excuse me, uh, we'd like to ask you some questions. Do you have any children? Were your children vaccinated? Because the only way we can actually find out how many children were vaccinated in the country of Indonesia, what percentage were vaccinated, is actually not on the internet, but by going out and knocking on doors. With all those paper forms, and I'm telling you, we have paper forms for every possible thing. And all these different paper forms for many different topics, they all have a single common endpoint, and the common endpoint looks something like this. And what we're looking at here is, is a truck full of data. Right. This is the data from a single vaccination coverage survey in a single district in the country of Zambia from a few years ago that I participated in. The only thing anyone was trying to find out is what percentage of Zambian children are vaccinated. And this is the data collected on paper over weeks from a single district, which is something like a county in the United States. You can imagine that for the entire country of Zambia, answering just that single question looks something like this, right? Truck after truck after truck filled with stack after stack after stack of data. And what makes it even worse is that that's just the beginning. Because once you've collected all that data, of course, someone's going to have to, some unfortunate person is going to have to type that into a computer. When I actually was that unfortunate person sometimes. I can tell you I often wasn't really paying attention. I probably made a lot of mistakes when I did it that no one ever discovered. So data quality goes down. What makes it even more frustrating is that the, the data entry part, the part that I used to do as a grad student, can take sometimes six months. Sometimes it can take two years to type that information into a computer. And sometimes, actually not infrequently, it actually never happens. Now try and wrap your head around that for a second. You just had teams of hundreds of people, they went out into the field to answer a particular question. You probably spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on fuel and photocopying and per diem, and then for some reason momentum is lost or there's no money left, and all of that comes to nothing because no one actually types it into the computer at all. The process just stops. Happens all the time. This is what we base our decisions on in global health. Little data, old data, no data. And so I thought, 
what would happen if we built software to do what I'd been consulting in? Instead of training people how to put forms onto mobile devices, let's create software that lets them do it themselves with no training and without me being involved. And that's exactly what we did. So we created software called Magpie, which has an online form creator. No one has to speak to me. You just, you just have to hear about it and go to the website. You can create forms, and once you've created the forms, you push them to a variety of common mobile phones. Obviously, nowadays, we've moved past Palm Pilots to mobile phones. And it doesn't have to be a smartphone. It can be a basic phone like the phone on the right there, you know, the basic kind of Symbian phone that's very common in developing countries. And the great part about this is it's just like Hotmail. It's cloud-based, and it doesn't require any training programming consultants. But there are some additional benefits as well. Now, we knew when we built the system, the whole point of it, just like with the Palm Pilots, was that you'd have to you'd be able to collect the data and immediately upload the data and get your data set. But what we found, of course, since it's already on a computer, we can deliver instant maps and analysis and graphing. We can take a process that took two years and compress that down to the space of five minutes. Unbelievable improvements in efficiency. Cloud-based, no training, no consultants, no me. In the second three years, we had 14,000 people find the website, sign up, and start using it to collect data. Data for disaster response, Canadian pig farmers tracking pig disease and pig herds, uh, people tracking drug supplies. We've created a tool that lets programs keep kids in school, track the number of babies that are born and the number of babies that, are, that die, to catch criminals and successfully prosecute them, to do all these different things, to learn more about what's going on, to understand more, to see more, and to save lives and improve lives. To get beyond uh, dealing with cost reduction as simply a procurement game, uh, that it's about standardizing care. That actually in some disease area is the difference, can make a difference of almost 30%. Another is uh, providers. Uh, we have seen some providers early in the game right now that are starting to take on more risk as part of becoming more accountable care organizations. And they have already started in partnership with others uh, to understand what drives quality cost outcomes and are starting to then put in place mechanisms within their institutions uh, led by the chief medical officer to align and standardize the practice of care. Right? Another example is uh, pharmaceutical. They have found that they need to provide real world evidence of their products, not just what comes out of the clinical trials that they have sponsored, but that it works. So in the past, it was good enough if you got it past the FDA. Now you have to convince them that this actually has an incremental benefit to the existing practice of care. And we've seen some real examples of uh, pharmaceutical companies that were able to use this to get to a higher tier of pricing because they were able to show in the real world this had better impact. And now we're suddenly uh, reviewing data. We don't know what quality it is. Coming off of clearing houses, lab results, lots of errors, right? A lot of pushback around whether that is voodoo science. Right? And so being able to address that this is not a substitution of clinical research that's randomized, this is a complement to it. It has a couple of features that you can't get by just doing research in the normal way. Uh, you can get at much larger population sets, so you can slice and dice it in ways that make sense. You can personalize it, understand variations by individuals. The ability to address that head on and say, that, well, this is going to happen anyway. You already have a lot of people poking into this. Let's start to address it in a way that uh, makes sense of it in the right way and can be used in a way that unlocks value.